name's Ted Krause. Not loading. There we go. Okay, I'm the investment director at TechCode. Um, you're in our Silicon Valley incubator right now. Uh, this is also the headquarters for our Global AI Plus Accelerator Program and part of the venture fund that we run. Um, this is my email. You guys can reach out to me anytime you want and I will reply within a reasonable time period. And that is the US Tech Code website. Um, techcode.com routes you to a different website, so this talks more about this location. I also have a personal website at techcrowse.com if you want to learn more about me. Um, basically, I've been both an operator and, uh, and an investor for about 15 years. I started my first tech company when I was 16 years old in high school. Um, it was before they had cell phones with alarm clocks on them. Um, when you're going to go to college, back in the day, uh, they used to have landlines, and so my brother and I created the world's first web-based wake-up call service that they used to have in dorms. So I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember dorm rooms with landlines and actual CD players like the Sony Dream Machine. That's what they had when I was in school. So uh, that was the first startup that I did. I've done several other ones after that. Um, Currently the investment director at TechCode. Prior to TechCode, I joined in May. So prior to TechCode, I was a partner at TechRx Ventures, which is a unique turnaround venture fund. We would find one or two venture-backed tech companies per year that were struggling to scale. Uh, as you know, most startups, if you do receive money, or if you don't, you run into hurdles and there's pitfalls you gotta navigate around. It's a big problem. And so our expertise was to find a couple startups per year, deep tech startups with IP, that had kind of hit a wall and that were either winding down, meaning that they're insolvent and they're going to go away, or um, they're just kind of having problems. We would fix them. Um, I was with TechRx for three years. We worked on many companies, genetic sequencing, robotics, um, consumer web, fintech hardware companies, all kinds of companies. Uh, one of the big ones that you guys might know of here is called Fetch Robotics. Um, it's a warehouse automation robotics company. Um, great company, so that's a big win from TechRx. Uh, before TechRx, I was a partner at Eight Rivers Capital, I'm sorry, I was a principal at Eight Rivers Capital in Durham, North Carolina. Um, the two big deals that I worked on at Eight Rivers, one was in the energy space. We basically invented a new thermodynamic power cycle that burned supercritical carbon dioxide as a working fluid in a big power plant. Uh, produces cheap, clean electricity. So it's not, it's, it's not renewable, because it does burn, not gas, but it's still cheaper and cleaner. Uh, the other company was called Bystand. I actually was the founder and the COO of that company. Um, it was, easiest way to describe it would be a Priceline type of a model for consumer goods meets REI. So Priceline meets REI. You want a product, you want it for your price, how do you get it? Typically you have to wait for that product to go on sale, you have to wait time, right? So we, made, we, we enabled consumers to basically express their willingness to pay, and then uh, um, a seller could express their willingness to sell, and we would match them in an online order book. So that was the second startup that was a big one for me. Um, that was in Durham. Prior to that, I was an analyst at Tech Coast Angels. So I've kind of worked my way up both in operating startups and also in investing in them. Um, so I'm going to move on from me now. What is Tech Code? What does it do for startups? So you're sitting in one of our incubators. Uh, Tech Code is a global network of incubators. Our headquarters is in Beijing. We have offices in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Wuhan, Nanjing, Jashan, many other cities in China. With Korea, Berlin, Tel Aviv. We just opened Finland in Helsinki a couple weeks ago. Uh, we obviously have Mountain View. You're sitting in our office here in Mountain View. And um, we're getting ready to open many other hubs. And these will be smaller. This is a very large building. These hubs will be smaller buildings, but they will still deliver the same level of services. So the incubators, TechCo does three things for startups. Okay, And this is the first thing that we do for startups. We operate this global network of incubators that provide startups with access to subsidized office space. Here in Mountain View, it's very expensive to rent, rent an office or rent a desk. Um, we do have space here available. 
Um, it starts at about $300 per desk. And then the other thing that incubator companies get is they get access to our human capital and they get access to the ecosystem. So for example, right now we're, we're streaming this event to many of our other incubators all over the world. And so if there's a startup there that wants to learn about Hardware Massive, or earlier today, for example, we had NVIDIA here doing a workshop talking about their GPUs for deep learning. Um, you get access to that if you're part of the incubator. Um, there are currently over 300 startups in the incubator ecosystem. Um, and it's a really great way uh, if you, if you want to have a nice, cost-effective, you know, cost relatively low-cost uh, office in a major city center. Downtown Mountain View, a desk would probably be about $1,000. Here, it's highly subsidized, about $300. So the first thing that we do for startups is um, we operate these incubators for human capital. The second thing that we do for startups is we operate two accelerators. One is an AI Plus accelerator that's headquartered from here, this location. Uh, the other one is a MedTech accelerator that's headquartered in Tel Aviv. Each accelerator is global. About half of the companies from B will be from where the headquarter is located. So here in Mountain View, we have about 25 that are local and about 25 that are all over the world for the AI accelerator. Uh, in Tel Aviv, for the MedTech accelerator, we have about 25 that are local and about 25 that are from all over the world. Um, we do not invest money up front. So this is one of the things I'm going to discuss in a few minutes on uh, the different types of accelerators. Uh, our accelerator does not invest money up front. Rather, it's a three-month program. We do invest intellectual capital, meaning the guys from NVIDIA coming to our office and doing a, um, a workshop. I lead a workshop on design thinking and financing strategy. We have many other subject matter experts that lead workshops and provide services. And they're typically highly subsidized services as well. So if you have a, um, a consumer hardware startup and you, uh, you need to make sure that your marketing conversion funnel is set up the right way and it's optimized on your website, we have people that are subject matter experts that can come in and help you figure out that CPA for LTV equation. Um, these people have done it before, they've done it multiple times, and they can help you. So that's on the marketing side. We have people that are deep tech subject matter experts that can help with the FMA, manufacturing, um, any type of industrial design. Uh, we have many industrial partners that can do everything from PCB board manufacturing and design, they can do industrial design like I mentioned. Um, they can also help you with distribution channels all over the world. So if you're a US startup and you want access to uh, the, you know, Israeli market, our guys in Tel Aviv can help you with that. If you're a Chinese startup and you want access to the U.S. market, some of our subject matter experts can help you with that here. And many of our industrial partners can help you, you know, with distribution channel, as well as just general making other introductions to, uh, to other industry partners. Um, so like I said, there's two accelerator programs we don't invest up front. The, the intellectual capital is one of the three types of capital. So I mentioned human capital with the incubators. Intellectual capital is invested through our accelerator. And the accelerators also serve as a really great way for me and my other fund manager associates to dig in and do really thorough due diligence on the companies. So the accelerators also serve a purpose to help us with due diligence for our venture funds, which invest the financial capital. And that's what I'm going to discuss here. So our venture funds, basically we have two funds. Uh, one is Tech Code Fund 1. It's a larger fund and invest a uh, dollar amount greater than $50,000. The accelerator funds invest $50,000. We have, again, like I said, we have um, about 50 companies in each accelerator right now. Um, we don't know which ones we're going to invest in and we will not invest in all of them. They have to prove to Tech Code that they are very good. Our investment structure and our thesis is very merit-based, so, and it's also very balanced. They don't have to pay us any compensation to join the accelerator, but they do have to prove to us, if they want us to invest financial capital, that it's a risk-mitigated deal, that the team can execute, that they have a good market strategy, that the founders are coachable, all of these things. Just, they're very, very important things, um, and we look at all of them, and I'm gonna show you guys what a general idea of an online deal room looks like in a second. Um, so again, there's really three types of capital. 
And to be a very effective uh, incubator and accelerator, you really need to be able to invest all three. You can't just say we're going to have, we're going to buy a piece of real estate somewhere and we're going to just have an accelerator. The people that are working there, they have to walk the walk too. They have to be able to roll their sleeves up, dig into the trenches, figure out what the needs are of the startup. Each startup in our accelerators has different needs. They all do. It's very difficult to figure out what they need specifically. And then our job is, is to basically execute, help them scale, help them hit milestones for a couple of months and prove to us that it's a good deal. So the incubators invest human capital, the accelerators invest intellectual capital, and serve as due diligence for our venture funds, which invest the financial capital. That's the easiest way to think about tech code. Um, and those are the three things that we do for startups. Now, enough about tech code. So there's plenty of incubators and accelerators all over the world. Um, and they all say that they do certain things, and they're all awesome. Every one of these guys on this board right here, they, they are, they're all great brands. Some of them have become more famous than others. Some of you guys may have actually spun out of some of these. You may have attended some of these incubators and accelerators. Um, the one thing in common is they all start out with the same mission, which is to help startups. And there's, these are just some. I mean, you can do a Google search and find plenty of you know, lists and lists of accelerators wherever you are throughout the world. Um, these are just some of the, you know, the ones that I could find. Um, there's also some hybrid VCs. Bolt really isn't an, an accelerator or an incubator. They're up in, the, in San Francisco. They're more like a hybrid VC. One of the best for hardware, though. Um, traditional VCs are different. They just invest financial capital, and then they sit on a board if they get a board seat, too. Um, you guys will notice some of these brands, some of the logos here, uh, right around downtown Mountain, Mountain View where we are. We have, you know, obviously Y Combinator, Playground Global, Stardex is at Stanford, 500 Startups is down the street. Um, there's several in LA, there's several in, up in the city, Hacks is a very famous one that's up in the city, Highway 1, Luminous Labs as well. Um, and some of these are just kind of all over the world. Plug and Play is global as well. These are all great. Everybody does different things though. Here, we try to invest all three types of capital. We try to do it, we try to keep the, the deal when a startup joins the accelerator very fair and balanced. We wanna make sure that, you know, since we're not investing up front, we don't make them pay us compensation up front. It has to be fair. The second that they start paying us, we owe them. The second that we invest, they owe us. We have to, it's very merit-based, like I said. So for tech code, the startup has to prove to us that it's a good deal. Um, Okay, so big question. What's the difference in an incubator and an accelerator? In my opinion, incubators are just, uh, it's a way to, to basically get subsidized office space, like I said, in an ecosystem. So the incubator operator has built some type of ecosystem. There's um, industry partnerships, there's strategic partnerships, there's workshops, there's networking events, there's parties, there's... Um, all kinds of things that you want to have to build and maintain a strong ecosystem. You have, to, you have to open up communication. That's the one thing that Silicon Valley has been really great at over the years, is it's very open in terms of communication. If you need something here, you can probably go to you know, Phil's Coffee or Starbucks or any number of restaurants and find someone that has a connection that can help you. The trick is just getting out there and communicating. And with any of these, these incubators, they want to basically do the same thing. Some of them do invest money up front. Uh, the incubators do. Some of them don't. But if you're a startup, you just need to understand that. Accelerators are a little different. Um, they're typically three months. Again, incubators are, you can say, indefinitely or for a longer period of time. Accelerators typically have a time constraint. Ours is three months currently, which is our second cohort. Our first accelerator, which started in May, it was a six-month accelerator. It was an AI plus hardware accelerator. We had nine companies. It was successful. The companies were excellent. Now we have 50. So we're scaling ours. It's more startups. We need more people to help them. Um, but again, for tech code, it opens up the deal flow for us. So. Incubators, kind of an indefinite time to stay there. 
as long as the startup is able to continue to pay. Um, sometimes they invest money, sometimes they don't. Sometimes the deal terms are onerous with, ex with traditional accelerators, you have to be careful about this. Um, so this gets into the next thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, I kind of call this power politics and negotiations because it was a class, that was literally the name of, the, of a class that I had in my MBA program. Um, great class, but so how do you, if you're a startup, how do you choose an accelerator? How do you figure out you know, how to apply to it? If they do let you in, if you go through the, uh, the, uh, the application process and the interview process and they really like you, how, and then they give you some deal terms, how do you negotiate with them? Some of them are just stone cold, you know, poker face. No, we don't negotiate. If you're a really good company and you have amazing traction, you have leverage. Some of them don't negotiate though, but you have to be aware of that. And then how do you get the most out of an incubator or an accelerator? Um, and it's all about figuring out specifically what your needs are, specific to your company, being very clear about that with them during the whole interview and application process and then making sure that the incubator or accelerator actually can deliver something. Um, and there's no real way to guarantee that they can, but you need to be pretty sure. So you need to mitigate as much risk as you can because you, you're sitting on equity, the cost of capital for working with an incubator or an accelerator is not cheap. Some of the ones that were on the board and that, you know, that had all the brands up on the board, they're very expensive. Maybe they give you 100K, but maybe they take 8% of your company for 100K. Maybe they give you 125, and then they take 6%. But the second you sign, you have to pay them for the rent, 25K for rent. You know, It just depends on what, the, what, what their business model is. And you have to be very clear on that. Always, always, always have an attorney. Pay for an attorney, find a corporate attorney. Sometimes they will work on deferred payments. They're, that's what they're there for. They want to help startups. Find an attorney, show, show them the agreement, and make sure that they answer any questions that you have. Um, okay, so how do you choose one? Uh, this is for hardware companies, so there are some that are just specifically focused on hardware. Hacks, Highway One, Limnos, Playground, these guys are kind of focused on hardware. Um, YC, they have hardware companies in their cohorts. They're, they're not only focused on hardware though. So it just depends. If you want to go to one that's really just focused, they're going to probably have the most, um, the, the best quality service providers. Um, so, you know, there are specific hardware accelerators though. How do you apply to them? They all have their own application processes online. Some are just on AngelList. If you don't have an AngelList profile, it takes a few minutes to set it up, do it. You can apply to many accelerators and incubators online on AngelList. It's a great platform to do it. Uh, we set up an application process on AngelList and we got about half of our applicants from there. Um, we had over 200 applicants for our last accelerator. And this is the second one that we've ever done within one year. So it's a great, you know, it's pretty good. AngelList is great. Um, now how do you negotiate with them? Uh, the application process, just be clear, the one thing that these guys all wanna see as well is just traction. That's the only way to really mitigate risk is to prove that you have traction. If you don't, if you don't have a working prototype, you know, I always say you only have one chance to make a good first impression. So, and a lot of people say that as well, but you just need to be very careful. You don't want to like introduce yourselves to these people if you're not ready. Make sure that your product is good. Make sure that the market size is good. Make sure that you know what you're talking about. You have a very, very clear marketing strategy. If you're making a consumer hardware product, the biggest problem is how you're going to sell it. How do you market it? Who are you going to market it to? How much is it going to cost? What is the lifetime value of that person that you just bought? If you can figure out that equation, then you have something. But that's really hard to figure out if you're pre-product or you just have a prototype and you're not in the market yet. Kickstarter campaigns, Indiegogo campaigns, they're great to kind of prove initial traction. Um, it's not cash flow. They're buying perks, they're buying product that you actually have to deliver to them. Um, I know I have many friends that have done crowdfunding campaigns and they, you know, they get a lot of money, they think that they can use the money, it's to develop your product and sell it and, and give it to the people that bought the perks. Um, but it is a good place to prove traction. If you have a crowdfunding campaign and you guys get 10 million 
say you know you sell enough perks to reach some big huge threshold and you become famous that's great the odds are not there though there's also no elves in a back room somewhere that are going to get you sales get you perk sales you have to actually be in charge of about 40 percent 30 to 40 percent of the perks they need to come directly from you within the first 24 48 hours and if they don't you're in trouble you may not hit that goal threshold that milestone so just make sure that you have a good rep that you're talking to at the crowdfunding uh, platform that can help make sure that you're ready for it. You don't want to, if you're not ready, don't go out there. Um, anyway, so how do you negotiate with them? Uh, I had a conversation today, actually, with someone who um, is a friend of mine. He's in the Tech Code Accelerator. He's in our AI Accelerator. He also applied to another accelerator program. Some accelerators and incubators do not want you to do that. Um, it dilutes their equity position. The more, it, it's not, some of them are very careful about that. Some accelerators don't like you to even raise money while you're in there. They don't want you to go and talk to VCs. They want you to wait until demo day. I think that's fine and it's a great model. Um, for tech code, we want people to be as successful as possible. And so this guy, he's in our AI accelerator. We just started working with him. He has a great product. And he was, yesterday, he found out that he was accepted into another program that's just as good as Tech Code. It's just a different, they have a different value add. And it's in a different location that we don't have an incubator in. And he asked me, he said, look, these guys want X amount of money. Uh, they, they want X amount of equity for this much money. And I said, it's very expensive. It is. Um, I'm not going to name any names here, but I can tell you some of the numbers. So these guys wanted to invest $25,000 US for 6%. It's not that much money, really. That barely, that doesn't really do anything. It might keep the lights on, it might let you rent uh, an apartment in this city where this, where this accelerator is for a couple months, for a couple people. Um, and then, then the other thing is that they offered another $100,000, but there's some onerous terms. And so if they take that $100,000 plus the 25, they'll end up selling about 10% of their company. So it's very expensive. And I said, well, what are you gonna get out of this? What do you want out of it? These guys, they don't have a hardware product, but they do have a SaaS product that's in the software engineering space. And this accelerator program has, I think, near 1,000 alumni startups globally in it. And all of those startups, with the exception of the ones that have been acquired already, they're all potential customers for this specific company because they all have engineering teams and they all need to do specific things to optimize their sprints and to make sure that they know what they're doing. And so, is it a good idea to sell 10% of your company for 125K? No, I wouldn't recommend that. This guy's term sheet that I saw had a higher valuation than that anyway. But what I recommended to him was, if you can guarantee that you're gonna get access to the alumni network and the alumni email list, and not just an info at some startup.com, but an actual person, like a human that they can contact, they have a great sales pipeline. This is gonna help them gain traction um, in terms of potential beta customers for their, for their startup. And so that's the type of leverage that you have to think about if you're gonna try and negotiate. And so what I told him is I said, look, you need to talk to your team, your co-founders. If you guys are comfortable being diluted and they need to have their attorney show them what happens if they sell that much equity, what happens to their founder shares because Dilution is something that all founders need to understand very clearly. Um, I said basically, if you guys are comfortable with that, you need to make sure that you get in writing that you're gonna get access to all the past, the present, and all the future alumni, no matter what. There could end up being 5,000 alumni companies out of this accelerator in the next couple of years. It could be great, great sales pipeline. If these guys get access to it, in my opinion, it's, I can make an argument, I can make a case that it's worth, it's worth the equity because they'll, they theoretically could have a really strong sales pipeline. They could get it anyway, but they would have to do the legwork of creating connections to those startups. 
So that's one way to negotiate. Um, with the exception of a couple of those names that are on here, uh, most of these guys will negotiate a little bit. Some of them will not, and you just have to deal with that. They have brand equity. They're not going to negotiate. There's just nothing you can do about it. Um, so how do you get the most out of it? I told, I told you guys that you need to really know specifically what you need. One of the biggest things that we do here is a needs analysis. It's the first thing that we do when a startup joins our accelerator. Um, it goes, and I'll go through this with you guys in a minute. It basically, the startups tell us what their financial needs are, technology needs, marketing, operations, legal, personnel. They tell us everything. They have to be very upfront. It's like a doctor. You're going to your doctor, you're going to tell them very specifically what your symptoms are. Our job as the operators and the investors that are associated with these accelerators is to make sure that you guys, the startup founders, don't fall into these, pit, these pitfalls, these, these holes. That's what I had to deal with at TechRx. I had to renegotiate all kinds of weird cap table situations and debt, uh, bad debt and liabilities on balance sheet and having to like basically tell investors that they're going to get wiped out unless they do, you know, it's, it's a big problem. So make sure that you know very specifically what you need. Um, most of the time when startups go to an accelerator or an incubator, they just think that they need money. But really what you need is you need traction. Because if you have traction, then you can get money. And so you have to figure out what that is. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a, a very clear example. This is going to be basically a demo of what we do a tech code in order to help startups figure out what their needs are. Um, and I have shared this with everyone. This is just a basically a Google Drive folder. Um, I made one called Hardware Massive. And inside of this folder, there's all these different things. So for us, we have an AI Plus Accelerator. So this is where we would put a fully executed agreement. You'll notice the things in here, the folders kind of look like a deal room. They're the things that a startup would need to provide to an investor during due diligence. And I mentioned that our accelerators basically serve as a really good way for us to do significant, strong due diligence on the startups. So this is our online deal room. It's a great way to do it. So we ask for a cap table, financial statements. Um, if you don't have financial statements in your startup right now, you can find bookkeepers, you can get QuickBooks, you can find My Startup CFO is a great service. Uh, I think it's mystartupcfo.com. People can help you create financial statements. You need to have them, though, to show your balance sheet. I talked about liabilities. If I'm an investor, I don't want to see debt on a balance sheet. I hate that. That means that if I give you money, if, I, if you have $50,000 in debt and I give you $250,000, my money is not going to scale your company. It's going to pay back some old debt. And I don't want to do that. So you need to be very clear. I wouldn't recommend getting any debt if you don't have to. Um, HR documents is basically, if you've hired anyone, you need to be able to provide offer letters. They need to, do not, this is a big problem, do not verbally give employees options. They think that they have more options than they really have. They think they own stock, but they really don't. They have options. Like, there's a big problem. So do not say anything verbally. If you, if you hire people and you're going to actually give them options, make sure you have a legit option pool. Make sure that they understand what they're getting. Uh, don't do anything verbally, though. So you need to have very clear HR documents. IP, intellectual property, is just patents. Um, I like patents. I think it helps create defensibility. And software, it's a little bit difficult. And hardware, it's not as difficult. Um, you need to get a good patent lawyer. Again, you can ask your corporate attorney to introduce you to an IP attorney. You need to get one. Think about what you're doing that's different. This is how you're differentiated from your competition. Um, you know, it's just, it's important. So this is where we put our IP. Uh, sometimes investors will ask to have third party due diligence. We do that. It's kind of like a checks and balances for us. So if I'm doing due diligence personally, I can miss something. But if I'm, if I get another party, another group to do legal due diligence or third party due diligence, the odds are that we're going to catch any mistakes. Um, so you might want to have, if you do have a corporate attorney, you might want to have them write something up saying that you're incorporated in the U.S., you don't have any legal, you know, lawsuits against you, no one's going to jail in a year, this type of stuff. It's just important to have that. 
Other is just general other information. If you start your company out of a university, sometimes you do coursework for it. You can put that in here. It's always good to learn more about the company. Pitch deck. In this case, this is where I just put the deck that I showed you guys. Uh, term sheet. So tech code doesn't lead rounds. We follow, or, or, or we, we co-invest. We're not a lead investor though. We always want to. We want to make sure that there's a really strong lead investor, kind of an anchor that can help set the terms. Um, that's where you would put the term sheet. Now, that's just a general like idea of what a uh, general idea of what a uh, online deal room looks like. Okay. So now, gets into the real the real meat of this. We always do a needs analysis, and this looks very bare bones right now, but this is literally how I start. Today, if I, in, if I had a startup come into my accelerator today, I would sit down with them and I would say, what are your financial needs? What do you guys think you need in order to have enough runway to go 18 months? Hopefully they tell me. If they don't know, then they gotta go back to the drawing board and come back to me with a plan. And they do the same thing for all of this. Technology needs. If you're a hardware company, let's say you're a drone company and you need a computer vision expert, they can't build their computer vision part of this or they need an app that actually connects to the drone or they need to build the app or they have an Android app and they need an iOS dev. That's a technology need. That also falls into personnel needs too, but there's something there that's missing. Um, marketing, in my opinion, is, if you have a hardware product and you're selling to consumers, you need to have a really, really, really strong brand. And this is often super overlooked. I've seen uh, budgets that have 0% allocated to marketing, 0%. They think that they can just have an engineer throw up like a Shopify or a Squarespace e-commerce site and then convert, and it doesn't work like that. You have to have a very, very, very strong strategy for social media. You need to have influencers. You gotta have capital to do this. But I would recommend at least allocating 25% of your budget to marketing. So most of the time when I meet companies here, they come in, they have a working prototype or something, um, they need to optimize their landing page, they need to do some A-B testing, there's all kinds of online tools that you can use to, to do these things. Um, we have a list of tools. Um, every accelerator probably has other companies that have graduated from the accelerator that can serve to do those testing things. You just need to go through that. If they don't have anyone that's on the marketing team, here at TechCode and at most other accelerators, they have people that are subject matter experts. So we have Financial syndication experts. We have people that can help them build a, you know, they can help them build financial statements. We have people that can help them, highly subsidized service providers. So meaning that if they would normally charge ten thousand dollars for some service, maybe they charge a thousand here because they're part of tech code and they want to help startups. Um, and most accelerators have service providers that can do this. There are some service providers in the audience right now, and so that's the kind of thing that we would want to leverage you guys for. You get access to our startups, they get access to some kind of deal. That's how you keep everything balanced. That's the whole thing. Um, obviously, operations personnel needs, if they need a, let's say they need a Ruby on Rails developer in Silicon Valley, they cost $150,000 a year plus for a good one. If they need a Python dev, it's very expensive, right? Startups in Silicon Valley. Groups like TechCode and some of these other accelerators that I mentioned, they have a global footprint. Hardware Massive has a global footprint. You can get access to that human capital and the talent. So we can help startups find that Ruby on Rails or that Python dev or that whatever it is, Swift developer that can help them build whatever it is they need to build. And then legal needs is the other thing. You need to make sure that you're set up appropriately. You don't have any kind of weird licensing issues going on. I've dealt with so many companies that think that they actually own their IP and they don't. One of the co-founders owns it or somebody else owns it, or their dad owns it, or something like that. And you just need to make sure that that's all set up because it will come out in due diligence and then you will get screwed because you won't be able to close. So just make sure that you're all set up. This is how we basically figure out what we need to do. Every single day I work with startups and I, do, I go over this. Every day, every Monday, uh, I have 15 companies that I basically manage here, 15 to 17 companies. And that's my portfolio. That I, my job is to make sure that they don't screw up. And so I go over this every single Monday. And I come up with things that I need to execute on. And I give them things, milestones they need to execute on too. And then that's how we move forward. 
Um, so that's basically the first thing that we do is a needs analysis. If you join an accelerator and they don't do something like this, like let's say that they give you a lean canvas business model or some, something like that, it's a great exercise to do, but it's generic. You need specific things, and every startup has different needs, so this is very important. Again, it does look basic, but how would you explain this to an eight-year-old? Eight-year-old, what do you need? They'll tell you. That's the kind of conversation and communication that you need to have. Um, the next thing, and again, you guys can get access to this. If you're going to pitch to an investor, you need a one-sentence hook uh, that someone, a trusted intermediary, can email to one of their investor buddies and try and get you a meeting. You need a paragraph hook that they can put in the email, and you need a deck. Um, this I'll share with you guys if you want it. There's a million of these online. This is the one that I like the most. I'm just going to run through it really quick. Team, mission, problem, solution. You know, don't just build a widget. Build a solution to some problem that you find. I like demos. I actually hate decks. I hate them. Um, the best presentation that I ever saw was a Y Combinator company that got up on stage and they didn't have a deck and they just did a demo of their product and it was unbelievable. It was just shocking to me how good this thing was. It solved a huge problem and it was great. Um, if you have a great demo, use it. Do, just do the demo. Um, you don't have to always have a deck. Competition, you know, this is just general stuff. This is the most important slide on here. This is basically the traction slide. There's all kinds of stories that you guys can read about, you know, what did the Google guys do? They just took one slide out and raised money from all these big VCs. Maybe true. It's their traction. Is their, you know, was their, uh, their chart? What was their traction? How many users did they have? What was their growth rate? How much money are they making? This is the most important thing that you can actually have to talk to any investor. Make sure that you know all of these things for your industry. They're different for SaaS companies. They're different for hardware companies. Make sure that you know them. And again, I keep saying this, and this is going to be the third or fourth time I'm saying this, but if you're a consumer hardware company, you have to know how much money does it cost you to acquire a user, and what is the lifetime value of that user. That's a really important equation to know. Um, you know, marketing, financing, this is all generic stuff. Um, every accelerator probably has a different one of these. If you guys want to use this one, you can. Uh, Hardware Massive can share it, I think. Um, you guys can share it throughout Hardware Massive if you want, whatever you want to do. And then this is something that I use, uh, this fundraising pipeline. Um, my co-founder at the e-commerce company that I mentioned and I basically used this when we were trying to raise money. And it was, it, you know, if any of y'all have a CRM, Salesforce CRM or Sugar or something used for closing sales deals, closing leads, it's the same concept but it's for closing investors. If you're the CEO of a company, you need to be very, very, very organized when you're raising money, and this is a good way to do it. So, worksheet, investor pipeline, start here, it's pretty self-explanatory. You put in what you think the, the investment size is, what the probability of investment is, who the owner is, where they are, what stage they are, you know, fish is someone, let's say I want to go meet, like, some really famous investor, Kobe. Kobe just started a VC fund, right? I would love to go meet him, get his autograph, and then ask him to invest in the company. So that would be a fix, someone that I have no connection to, but I really would love to have a connection to. That one thing, the fish is a great, great, great ask, and a task, an action item, a milestone, that an accelerator, if they're a good one, can actually execute on. And this is one of the things that we at TechCode and a lot of the other accelerators need, they, they do, right? So you tell them who you want to meet, in this case it would be a fish, some really famous VC, has to be realistic though, or some, some person that's an investor, and then the accelerator becomes a trusted intermediary. And it works the same way that hiring and recruiting works. If you apply blindly to a job, the odds are not as good that you will get a call or an interview. Uh, than if you have a trusted intermediary make the introduction first. And it works the same way with investors. And so if you don't know, if you don't have a friend in your LinkedIn network or, or in your group of, of people that can actually introduce you, ask the accelerator too. 
So how do you get the most out of an accelerator? How do you get the most out of an incubator? Most of the time, startups want financial capital when they join. That's the purpose of them joining. Maybe they want to scale a little bit, you know, build something. But most of the time, they need to close around. Ask the people at the accelerator about their network before you actually sign the, the contract and the agreement. Ask them who they can introduce you to. Make them go through their, their Rolodex and show you some of their peers. And if they have good ones, they can make the introduction. They may wait. They may ask you guys to do something or hit some milestone before they actually make the introduction, but they can do it. So anyway, this goes through, um, and then it spits out something like this when it loads here in a second. And it's just like any kind of analytics dashboard that you would see. In this case, it shows like the total amount that I could possibly raise would be 5.3 million. It shows where people are. And as, a, as you know, the director of this program here at Tech Code, this is a, I can I can go to this file in any one of my startups any one any startup that's in my cohort I can go to this file I can see what that looks like and so I can see how likely they are to close who they're talking to what's the feedback then this is a great way for me to do due diligence it's also a great way for the startup to know what their problems are you have to know why you're not able to close rounds why are you not getting to the next meeting. You have coffee with a VC, and you the, the next the next meeting is to go meet his partners or her partners. Why are you not getting that? Something like this will tell you. You just have to be very diligent about using it. Um, and this is just one example that I used. You guys can make your own, put your own analytics on it, whatever you want to do. Um, if you want to use this, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. Some of our startups do, some of them don't. But this is just a very useful tool. Um, so those are basically the main three things that you want to, how do you get the most out of, a, out of being at an accelerator? Ask them to do things. If they don't offer to do a needs analysis the day you walk in, you need to make them do a needs analysis because that's how you'll find out what they can offer you, what their real value add is. So if I can give you guys one thing to take home is to remember if you do join an accelerator, With the exception of if you don't really have a fully baked product, then you need to work on your product. But if you have a product and you're at a stage where you're ready to start to talking to people, you need to do the needs analysis and ask them specific things. <coughs> Give them a task. If you don't ask them, if you don't ask for help, you're never going to get it. So, um, anyway, one more second here. That was kind of, that's like at a high level what we do. Um, so I want to see if any of y'all have any questions for me. I don't want to just talk at you for a long time. Um, but that's basically it. There's no magic bullet. Um, it's hard. I've been a startup founder. It's very, very, very hard. There's a, a lot of emotional ups and downs, and um, there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to do it. There's no guarantee you're going to be successful. Um, you can increase the odds that you will be successful by doing it right, making sure that you make ethical, honest, good decisions. You don't, you know, overinflate your traction metrics. It's a big problem because if you start doing that when you're when you don't have investors, when you do and you start having board meetings, it gets into a whole other bag of worms. Big problem, because then you have to continually lie. So don't inflate <coughs> metrics. Make sure that your traction numbers are legit. If you um, if you don't have traction yet, uh, there's actually a great article that I have. OK, so uh, I think the guy's name is Brendan Baker. He's a red point as a VC. He actually wrote a great article on traction and how to message it. Um, if you want the article, I have it uh, linked on my Medium, my blog. You can just go to techcrowds.com and click on blog, and then you can find the article. It's a really, really strong article on how to message traction. A lot of early stage hardware companies and software companies and all companies for that matter, they, they have something. Maybe they have some beta testers. Maybe they have a waiting list of people that want to use the product. What are the optics? How do you make that sound like you really have very strong traction? This article that, that this guy wrote, um, it really hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's just, it's excellent. So I recommend that you guys read it. 
Um, I can put a link to it in here if you want to share it, but it's a great, it's a great way to learn how to message traction.